Good afternoon. So I'm uh, Tiago Nakamura. I work uh, for uh, Nick BR, and now we are going to have uh, a hands-on uh, exercise how to configure RPKI in a delegate mode. So here we have the virtual machine. So here you can see that's beautiful. So here I'm going to install it starting from zero to see and I'm going to show you how you configure this and uh, it's different from uh, the delegate mode where you do everything in the web face but here in this way you need to have uh, your own infrastructure with a server in uh, an RPKI node, as Eduardo already told you. There, in the validation issue, there are several softwares that uh, will enable you to do that. In the case of the delegate mode, there's an ROA published publisher, and the situation is not as uh, varied as it might be. So, you there are 32 uh, softwares, one of them is, there are two softwares, one of them is Krill, uh, that is distributed under the Mozilla public license, and the other one is on GitHub. Now I'm going to show you under Krill, we use it uh, for the infrastructure of RPKI, and it has proven to be very reliable. So we are going to teach you how to install and configure Krill. If you have any doubts, please um, there, see that uh, there are, you can, you can put uh, questions uh, in the chat with uh, questions and answers. And if you're going to install a Krill in your server, there are some important things that you have to bear in mind. Here I'm using Linux. And one of the things that you need to be careful with is that in the delegate mode, the machine always needs to be on. It's not an equipment that can be configured and then turned off. You need to leave it on because you need to validate from time to time with the NICBR registry. So you need to have that precaution when, when you install this in your network because it can't be an equipment that you'll have to turn off. So it can be a virtual machine or whatever, but it needs to be a machine that can always be left on. To install Krill, what I recommend is to use the website of the developers of Krill. They're always updating um, step by step, that is that Everything is in the website that you can see here, rpki data, read the docs. Here, I translated this into Portuguese. Um, uh, to use at home for the people who have uh, problems uh, doing uh, reading English. So here you have a step by step uh, description. So we are going to see how we're going to configure here. The first thing that we'll do is to put uh, Krill in the repository here in the Linux packets, here 
we go to our terminal and we enter and uh, we'll see that you have this source uh, file that we can configure. We are going to edit this file and we are going to insert this line. This is the Linux version that we're going to use in this laboratory. We stick it here, we paste it. And we cannot forget the signature key so that this repository may work. So we have to put the signature. And we are going to insert the key. Now that we've put it, we can update sudo apt update. Now you'll see that uh, you already have the repository for Krill and he, now you can install Krill. So we put apt install and it will install it for us. So there you have it. It's rather the it's been installed. You see that it's simple. It's straightforward. They really improved the installing uh, uh, process. In the past, you needed to install many packages, but with this Linux repository, it's much easier. You don't need to worry. It's uh, automatic. So now we have Krill installed, and what do we need to do? Before before starting it, we need to configure a couple of details for this equipment. So I have a file that's called krill.conf. This is the configuration um, a file for krill. We have to edit it with uh, what we want for this server. Most configurations can be left in the standard um, way. Here, the folders have been created. Everything is working. The URL is this one here, HTTPS, uh, localhost, uh, 3000. If you want to change it, you can do that. And we are going to leave it with the same configuration. What is necessary, what you need to configure here, as a matter of fact, is this uh, auth token. This is the password that we will use to configure Krill. So this cross, this password is, um, we, we need to use uh, to the, the password that we're going to use. We're going to put LACNIC, just as an example. So we configure the password and now now we just have to enable the create service. If you want to have access to the step by step you, you, it's posted in uh, the LACNIC website, so you can have access to this. Here we um, put the krill, apparently it's all right. Now we want to check, we are going to have access to this URL that was configured for krill. So let's put the address, HTTPS, uh, um, localhost, uh, 3000. And it's going to protest because uh, it has a self-signed certificate. So it's not dangerous. So now we are having 
we're going to have to authorize the certificate and there you enter the CRIL system. CRIL what has already been translated to some languages and it's even in Portuguese. As I'm going to change it in, uh, in the, I'm going to leave it in, in Spanish, in, in Portuguese, because I have it in, uh, in, like, uh, in uh, Nick BR, because I'm going to show you how the system works in Brazil. The, the password is the one that we configured that was LACNIC. There we enter and we are there with Krill to start. Something that they're going to request you now is the name of your CA, the certifying authority. Here you need to put a name. De nomes, né? É, não precisa ser um nome único, tá? Pode ser um nome é, igual de outra pessoa, né? Não tem problema de conflito, tá? É, aqui, né? Pode pôr só alguma coisa. É... There is no issue here, no conflict. Ele vai avisar aqui, ó, se você... So here, it notifies you that once you have configured this here. Through the graphic interface, you can no longer modify this. There are other ways of using Krill. And this is through the command line. And this has certain advantages. For example, here in this interface, we're always limited to one certifying entity. So if you wish to configure for more than one certifying entity, you need a different format. In this case, you have a provider that only has one AS. So then they only have one CA configured. So here I created the CA. And what do I have to do now? I have to notify the parent authority, in this case, this is Nick BR, that I have created this here, this CRIL. I have to access the BR registration system and then set this up. The RPKI configuration has to be done there. I access the site the one that I have open here. Let's see if I'm a robot. I cannot see this very well. Okay, now it's okay. Good, I'm not a robot, that's good to know. Now I need to have chimneys. Good. So this is the most difficult part of the tutorial. And now we have the BR registry. Now, an important thing is that to configure RPKI, this can only be done by the autonomous system manager. They are the only one, that's the only person who is allowed to do so. So if you are the AS manager, the administrator, you can do so. And then in the end, you get all the data on the AS. And then at the end, you will find configure our PKI. This is only visible for the administrators. Okay, here we click on configuration. We have additional information. 
if there are any questions as to how to go about this. And this is what we're going to do right now. So what is this requesting here? It's requesting a child request. Now, where is this? I have to access Krill. And here in Krill, we have CAS for parent. And here, request of the CA, which is a daughter CA. So we're going to copy this. And we're going to paste this here in the child request. Now, what am I doing here? I am notifying the RPK system of NICPR that I installed a Krill in my network. I'm going to enable RPKI now. Now, that will notify me if that was successful or not. Here it says RPKI enabled successfully. Now, have I finished? No. I haven't finished much in the same way as I notified Nick BR who I am. I now have to inform Nick Krill who is Nick BR. So again, through this XML, which is called parent response, I'm going to copy all this address. And then here, down here, the system is asking me to include the parent CA response. And here I pasted the XML, uh, the parent's response. It's going to detect the information of the CAI, which is Nick BR CA. And then I'm going to click on confirm. So as from here, then your RPKI instance has been set up. It has been configured. Like Nick knows Nick BR, Nick BR knows your CA. So here, everything is already set. You can configure the ROAs to then announce them in the RPKI system, NICPR offers a second option in order to configure CRIL. And this is enabling or configuring remote configuration. If we leave it the way it is and we publish the ROA the way it is, whenever we consult the ROA, we also have to consult the Krill server, which because these are stored in that machine. Now, if you don't wish that everyone who is going to consult do the query, does a query in this machine, NICPR offers the option of hosting these in the NICPR. So I can enable here, configure remote publication. So we configure the remote publication where we have the publisher request. That publisher request is here where we have a repository. So there you have request of the publisher, the publisher request. We're going to copy the publisher request and we paste it here in the interface of the registration panel. And that has enabled the remote publication. If you pay attention to this, then this has the answer here. This is a publisher request and here As I said, remote publication has been enabled and it is being authorized. Okay. 
We're going to copy it. And we're going to paste it down here. Repository response. VXML. And here we have the repository response. And we click confirm. And ready. So basically, you have done everything that was required in order to set up your Quill. To publish the ROAs, then you have these will be stored in RPKI system. So if this is stable, or if you don't have stability, if this crashed or you have to restart it, this doesn't matter because these are, because the ROAs will be stored in the registry. There are a couple of important considerations. I enable remote configuration. Can I turn off the computer? No, you cannot. Because every now and again, Nick PR verifies to check which are the nodes that are changing the grill. So if your machine does not answer, then they invalidate the certificates. And with the certificates that are no longer valid, too long, together with these, the ROAs are discarded. It's not that they are stored in NICBR. You cannot turn off the machine. The machine has to remain on. But one isn't so much concerned about the requests, that, the queries that you have to respond to, or if people are going to check with the base. Okay. So we have everything ready. So now what we need to do, to do now is to configure the ROAs because this is what we're interested in in RPKI. So this is one of the parts that is the simplest. But we really have to understand what we want to do. Krill in order to help us conducts the query, it does a query of the RIPES routing table, which is the internet registry in Europe. It then maps what they see in the DGP table in terms of your data. So we click here in order to obtain an update in the VGP table to see which is the data that have a reference with my AS. How does Krill know which is my AS? How does Krill know which is my IPv4 block or my IPv6 block? So how does Krill know this? Well, the exchange of XMLs provides information in this and the registry is validating my data. So not just anyone can manage to do that kind of configuration. Let us remember that only the manager of the autonomous system can do so. So when you join the two, then we see that we confirm the data reference. So here we can verify who is who in the internet. They consult RIPE's BGP table and we see that they see that there are four different AS announcements that were configured recently as slash 40, as slash 48, as slash 22, and a slash 24 for IPv4. So what are the rows that I have to configure for internet? This is a topic on which we are learning still, in fact. So what would be the ideal world? In the ideal world, all the announcements I am making in the internet or for all these announcements there should be a ROA that validates them. And what I do not disclose should be invalidated by RPKI. So that obviously would be the ideal world. So how can I create that situation in Krill? I have the announcements here. And let us imagine that this is what I should inform through the internet. 
if someone wishes to inform a more specific route or a different type of announcement, I don't want that to be validated. So what do I do with Krill? I click on the plus sign. I click here and I see this panel with information on that AS. I click on confirm. So in the ROA, there is a reference regarding that announcement of the BGP table. In the ideal world then, what would I do? For each announcement on my BGP table, I would then generate an ROA. So with that, what I do is to prevent unexpected things in the BGP table. Now, what is the objection here? I must not forget that whenever I change something in my BGP table, I have to do something more specific, something different. I have to invalidate my RPKI. And whenever I change something in my announcements, I also have to alter this in my table, in my Krill table of the ROAs. Here, if I created the first announcement, this invalidates the second one. There is no robot that validates the second announcement. As duas ruas. Então, eu vou criar a segunda rua aqui. Pronto. Né? Agora os meus dois anúncios estão validados. Né? Se eu fizesse um terceiro anúncio de um barra 48 aqui né? e não criasse uma rua... Mas eu validei. Eu tenho um terceiro anúncio. Eu não crio um ROA. Isso vai ser invalidado no momento da validação. Então, eu tenho que criar um outro ROA sobre esse terceiro anúncio. Então, quando eu faço um adicional anúncio, we have to bear in mind that we need a specific ROA for that announcement. But, well, does it give a lot of trouble? Yes, we have to have an interval in the networks in order to be able to validate this. And if I wish to change the announcement in the BGP table, this should not be invalidated by the RPKI. Yes, it is possible. Now, if you, as follows, if you look at the information on the announcement of the ROAs, what do we have here? We have the ASN number and the prefix and the maximum length. What is this? That is the interval that you wish to validate in these announcements. So what it says is anything that is uh, 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 168.181. Uh, everything that is up to slash 22 is not valid. Uh, so that is. Yeah. This, so it has to be an interval 22, and if it's something more specific or something different than this, it will appear as invalid at the time of validation. So what can I change here? I can change, for instance, and put uh, the longest would be a slash 24. So what do I say with this? That anything that is inside this slash 22 up to slash 24, so within that slash 22, because of uh, RPKI, I'm going to consider it valid. So we confirm so that you may see what happens. So this only ROA, we can validate the two announcements because the slash 22 is part of that ROA and the slash 24 is also part of it because uh, the two are uh, if I change uh, my announcements, then what, what is the problem of this way of configurating the ROA? Once a ROA validates it, there's no way you can validate. 
So let's assume that I publish this slash 24, then another 24 slash 24 appears, but I am not the one who's doing it. So with that ROA, they are going to verify and say, well, part of that interval, if uh, that uh, there, they will announce that that slash 24, that the opposite aqui, né, dentro do seu CRIU, não vai ter como você invalidar um barra 24 específico, tá? Não tem uma rua, né, falando, ó, esse não pode, né? Só, There só are pode. no ROAs telling me that this cannot, so... So, with the ROAs, now, if this... this would happen. So we can do the test. Let's uh, do this test. We have a slash 24. I can say, well, I want to validate or create a specific ROA for this slash 24. So let's do this. Let's change here with this slash 24. Tá? Por quê? Porque ele fala, ó, não faz sentido você criar essa regra, porque a outra regra já engloba essa regra que você quer criar. Tá? Então, né, não precisa criar regras específicas, né? inclusive ele nem deixa né, criar isso. Agora, outras coisas importantes tá, para a gente prestar atenção. É... Existe validação né, do que, que eu estou criando aqui como ROA? Existe. Tá? Então, por exemplo... É... Vamos pegar aqui né, o nosso barra 22. Aí fala assim, né? ah, eu já estou configurado aqui, né? eu já sei, eu vou, eu vou tentar anunciar a rua de outra pessoa, né? de um bloco qualquer aqui. Ó. Então, vamos pegar o bloco 200. Então, ó, vou anunciar aqui o 200.123.20.0 barra 22. Né? Eu quero anunciar a rua aqui para o meu AS, porque aí eu, né, eu invalido o anúncio do cara. Eu posso fazer isso? Eu não consigo, tá? Por quê? Porque o CRIO faz essa validação, tá? Você só consegue publicar uma rua referente aos seus blocos, tá? Então, se você tentar publicar a rua de um outro bloco que não é seu, não vai poder. O que, que eu posso fazer, sim, tá? É publicar uma rua de um outro AS, tá? É, validando aqui, ó, um AS... 62456. Isso eu posso fazer. Tá? Então, ó, eu criei aqui a rua né, com um AS 62456. O que, que isso quer dizer tá, quando eu criei essa situação? Tanto né, o AS 61580 quanto o AS 62456 né, podem anunciar esse barra 22. Tá? Então, isso eu posso fazer, sim, tá? dentro da, do, do RPKI. Né? Eu posso a, anunciar uma rua é, permitindo outros AS divulgarem o meu bloco IP. Né? Por que, que isso é importante? Né? Porque, às vezes, né, é, eu sou né, um cliente de alguém e esse é alguém que me anuncia pela internet. Né? Não sou eu que faço o meu próprio anúncio. Né? Então, é, não vai aparecer como sendo o meu AS. Né? Então, aí, né? no caso, se você tem né? essa solução de clientes, né? que é, você anuncia né? por eles, tá? aí você precisa né? é, ter essa possibilidade aqui no CRIO né? de é, permitir que outros AS anunciem o seu bloco. Tá? Então, isso dá para fazer sim. Né? Ou se você usa outras ferramentas né? dentro do seu AS que precisam de outros AS. Ah. Ou se... Né? e aí você tem vários né, ASNs e você precisa validar né, que o seu bloco pode ser anunciado tanto por AS1, 2 ou 3, né? você precisa colocar isso aqui na rua. Tá? Então, isso aqui ó, não invalida tá, a minha primeira rua. Tá? Então, qualquer pessoa que anuncie né, com um ASN61580 está válido. Né? 
se a pessoa anunciar com esse outro, segundo a S, também está válido. Né? Então, são coisas que é, a gente consegue fazer aqui pelo CRIO. Tá? Se eu precisar remover né, alguma rua, né, eu clico aqui no lixinho, né, ele vai apagar tá, a rua do sistema. Tá? Lembrando que isso aqui demora um tempinho, né, porque ele vai apagar para mim, aí eu tenho que repassar isso né, para o NIC BR, né? Então, pode ser que, né? E depois, né? Os validadores têm que consultar essa informação atualizada. Tá? Então, é, não é, confiem né, nesse processo tá? para fazer alguma coisa imediata. Estou né? sofrendo um ataque, né? É, vou anunciar agora a rua para é, mitigar esse ataque. É, não vai funcionar, né? porque vai levar um tempo né? até os validadores se conhecerem tá? aquela rua. Tá, isso aqui é mais realmente para você configurar antes, né, para evitar futuros sequestros de blocos. Tá? Então, é essa é a situação que a gente espera né, ter aqui é, no CRIO. Tudo bem? É, bom, acho que da parte aqui de configuração do CRIO, era mais isso mesmo que eu queria mostrar para vocês, né? É, como vocês viram, né? é, não tem muito segredo, né? é, lá a instrução lá deles é bem clara, né? é, de como você instala, como é que você né? é, faz a configuração. Tá? A parte mais complicada mesmo né? é o que, que eu quero publicar né? no sistema da RPKI, quais são as ruas né? que eu quero publicar. Né? Então, é, aqui o, o CRIO ele te dá uma ajuda já né? consultando a tabela BGP, só que isso aqui pode confundir, né? Se você não sabe né, o que isso significa, ou se você né, é, não sabe de onde está vindo né, esses anúncios, porque às vezes né, é, você está com os anúncios errados né, na internet. Então, se você está anunciando coisa errada, né, vai aparecer aqui na tabela. Né? Então, é uma coisa importante também de você estar tá verificando né, e entendendo bem né, o que você está fazendo é, nos seus anúncios do BGP, né, para aí sim configurar né, as suas dentro do seu sistema, ok? To configure the ROAs é in the system, I think it's this. Um, if there are any doubts, put in the chat, and because afterwards we'll be able to read and to answer them, answer your doubts. Perfecto. Eh, bueno, continuamos acá en lo que. All right, let us now go on where we left, as I said, we're now at this stage of the RPKI and Milaknik, we created the ROA. Please share your screen, Carlos, don't forget. So we can see your screen now, thank you. So I was telling you that we already, uh, we already in this part, in the second stage, the certificate, and now let's go on to the third stage. Let us update the RPKI repository of LACNIC in order to update this information. And after that, I will then have this information and validate the announced routes. So now let us update this information on the repository here. It takes a while. Vamos a esperar que esto se actualice por acá. We can wait until this is updated. So while this is updated, we're at this level. We have the RPK app system and the LACNIC RIR, we're generating the certificate, we generated the ROA, and now we're generating the repository. We're in this stage. What follows? Through the validators, 
whether RIPE NCC, we access the repository we, through RSync or RP. We're going to do this through RSync, RSync and we're going to get this information here into the validator. The validator processes the information, it validates the routes and generates the cache, cache which is then the RTR is sent to the routers and then on to the internet to propagate the routes. Let's check the updating. Let's check the status. So the update finished. And now we will, we will start with the RIPE validator. I have in my machine the RIPE NCC validator in its version three. I'm going to give you a link afterwards where we see it is easy to have these validators and the steps you have to follow. I have the validator here. Prior to that, I added, because I'm testing this in a demo platform for RPKI. So for the validator to function first, it has the trust anchors of the RIRs. And the one of Arin, well, we have to accept the disclaimer and then they do this process. I have the tal file for the purpose of this demo and I include it here in order to do the validation exercise. So here we're running the validator. We are also updating it. And then we are going to enter so it's running in this port here, but you can change it. You have a configuration file where you can change this. And then the link we'll see later on shows you the documentation as to how to go about this. So here we have the interface of the RIPE validator and it shows me this repository, which is a demo platform that I have configured. So if I access here, it shows me that have an, a repository which an access here and these are the ones that are valid. So let me specifically look for this one that I created previously. We're going to put the validated ROAs here. Here I have the ROE that I created and I got the validator from the repository. And then we have the other prefix. We see that we have the other prefix, prefix with the maximum length. In this case, it is a 46 slash 46 prefix with a maximum length of 48 as we saw down here. Now let us check the route. And this, well, this is a demo platform, but these are the announcements. That are done through this ASN, it's not the correct one. But what we have is that we already created the ROA in the validator. The validator brought these directly here. So let us check. Let us check this directly. In the routinator 
validator. The three validators we're going to use are in the link we're going to see later on. We'll see how this is here. We are just going to run the command. Let's uh, run a routinator. Let's see. And now we'll run the command to get uh, the data, the validator that will bring all the information of the RPKI repository. And this prints all of the information of RPKI of the validator. Now I have the doubt because I published this through the ASN. Let's see. Let's check here. And now it prints a listing of ASNs and announced routes that are valid. Now we look at this and I see the ROA that I created with the prefix. If I look at the other block. Let's uh, take this down. I look for the other block and I see that I have ROA 28,000 with uh, the prefix uh, 201 uh, 13 C 7 uh, slash uh, uh, 46 uh, and there I run two validators and I have these two in my equipment and we see how the information that I generate in RPKI ends up in the repository. And finally, through the validator, I get this information and I show it as valid Let's conduct the test there with the four validator. I have it in a virtual machine. When you enter, then it creates, uh, when you validate it, it creates a default route and we'll run the command to raise four in uh, standard mode and for it to print uh, the ROA um, file and for all the cases for RIPE and for these uh, different cases for FORT and this one I downloaded the trans anchor of the demo platform and I'm only accessing this platform. So I have to run it. So let's clean this. I see that now I have this. If I change the file, this gives me the listing of all the ASNs with, with the routes and the maximum lengths, and we'll see the prefix. We'll look for it here. I have the prefix with AS28000 and the prefix with its maximum length to slash 48. Let's see the other. 200, 10, 62. 
I see that I have the PV4 address, the IPv4, with a range of 23 to a maximum of 24. Here I see how I generate RPKI information and this is reflected outward as the, as the repository uh, generates it and then as the validator has it. At this stage, the validator went uh, to our sync, uh, got the information from the repository, and here it uh, generates the cache of the validator, and then these routers consume through an RTR, and this finally leads to the announcements uh, in the validators. So this, depending on uh, the year rules of the of the router, then it will follow different paths. So now we're going to do the contrary. We are going to take the information generated from with RPKI. We're going to eliminate the ROA that was created and we're going to run the validators again and we are going to check the, the route. When I when the repository is updated after deleting an ROA, this no longer appears in the internet. So let's go to the Mila Knick platform. Let's revoke the ROA. Here, the message is that it has been successfully revoked and now I have to run the repository again to update the changes. So I enter here. RTA management, this is a demo platform and I update. It's updating it. Let's wait until it gets updated. In the meantime, I'll check another ROA, the validator. We'll wait until it runs before we do the exercise that we described earlier. And then we're going to see another part in the RPKI platform where they show the listing of the prefixes of your organization and the validity status of that information, how it appears, how it is shown. These are the commands that I run, then we'll see in a new link how you can enter, how to download the packages related to each validator and how to raise them. These are just the commands for raising them. So now the validator has completed uh, its uh, run. Now let me clean this. Let's open a new window here. I'll enter the routinator validator. All this is in my equipment. And we'll raise again and see the information that Routinator brings. Okay. As I was checking earlier, Uh, 
let's check the prefix in the uh, routinator validator. You see that it no longer that the information no longer appears because I deleted it. Then up, I updated the repository again. And finally, when the validator goes to RPKI uh, repository, they no longer find this route. So it won't be in the ASN prefix routes. And the same applies to the other block that we had here, IPv6. So the block doesn't appear. If we do it in the fourth validator, we'll do the same. Just here we had the ROA files generated earlier. Now we are going to delete it. And we are going to run the command again. And this will generate a file with the, the valid ROAs. And this finished. And now I see that I have the file that was generated. Here it has generated everything, generated everything again. Um, I don't have it. And finally, we're going to do it with this prefix. No. So I don't have the routes that I removed when I revoked the ROA. Finally, what we're going to do is to enter the third validator by uh, RIBIS. I'm running this so that it will be maintained. Here I have this installed locally, the files that were generated, uh, the ones that were saved by the previous repository, everything is new. Obviously, this has a configuration file with time parameters, updating and when to clean it, etc. that are configured, but because of a Oh, well, because this is a tutorial, I run it uh, manually just to show you how it works. So after deleting this, you'll have to download everything again. So let's raise this. I run it and uh, you are synced to download it to the repository. There it's running. And it is finishing with the update. We're going to look at the interface to double check whether this has been finished. So let us enter. Local host. I have 5,401 objects. And if I check in the ROA section, we have the ones we created previously. And I see none have been matched related to that ROA because I deleted that. So we see here how when we generate RPKI information, we 
finish accepting what has been published in the internet. We add, we delete, but then we have what has been updated. So here, we did the exercise of generating the ROAs, we updated the repository, and when to the validators, we double check whether the ROAs are still updated. The validity in our RIPE, for example, includes information on the current PGP announcements and the real ones. So I'm checking this with the demo platform. But anyway, the exercise I wish to share with you was this one precisely, namely how we can easily use a BLACNIC platform and create this information here. So we go back to the ROA part, we create another one. So let us leave this one here. Here I have an ROA created with three prefixes. And I can edit this one if I wish. We can add another prefix here, for example. So I have the edited ROA with these prefix. If I need to create a further ROA with another ASN, but with similar prefixes to this one here, I can simply edit the ASN and this generates an identical ROA. So finally, we have revoke. So finally, another interesting thing here is management of the certificate as such. Basically here, you have the information on that certificate, the series, the serial number, the resources, IP4, IP6, ASN, the publication information, validity date, and then update certificates if I have more resources now. I can go to this part here and update the certificates. So it generates another one with the resources that were changed. And if I have less resources, I do the same thing. I go here and I click on update and I begin with this process. And this ends up updating the certificate, which then leads to updating the repository and everything else that has to be updated, the prefixes and the ROAs or whatever corresponds. And then let's leave the revoking of the certificate for the final part. Then there's another interesting thing that we have here in MILACNIC, which is the report or the RPKI status. This is a disclaimer, and then here, this is how it works. So basically what we do here is the following. Once a day, we do the dump with a BGP of RIPE, and then we download information of the ROAs generated by the validator, and then verify the prefixes of the organization, the status of the validation of the prefixes with the information that we downloaded. So based on that, we show the status of the validity of the ROAs. This case here is the following. So if, for example, if 
you have not found or you have a invalid message for the ROA, it will show you the suggestion of how to correct this. And if there is any kind of error or if this is not, this is not valid or some other criteria that you have here in the interface, you will see you have the option of correcting this. Maybe because the ASN is not valid or maybe the route does not coincide. So then you have the option of editing this ROA here and then correcting it. So basically what this will show you is that this information is updated once a day and you directly get the option of creating that ROA that you were correcting previously. For example, this is the AS number, save. And then I created another ROA with the AS number 28,000. Now let us repeat the cycle to generate this information and then close this section on the validation with the validators here. Let's do it for the third time. While we run this here, let me go back to the presentation. So what is the validation that has been done in the validators? Or what did we seek to validate when we have the RPKI information? What they verify is the validity dates of the certificates and other data that were generated. You verify the signature and the signature path to the, throughout the chain of trust. And you also verify that the certificate does not appear in the list of revoked certificates. And this is important when you carry out that validation because it is meaningless to have a certificate, to work with a certificate that has been revoked. And then you also verify that the list of revoked certi uh, certificate list is in force. That's a valid one. Then you check the consistency between the publications and manifests. So this is what I declare and check to whether that is consistent with what has been declared in the repository. Let me give you an example. So you have your supermarket list with a list of items and through that list, I check whether I have everything that was included in the list. So that's how the manifest works. If there are more things, an error is generated. If there are less things, you also have an error because there is a discrepancy between what I said has been published and what really is included in the repository. And basically the inclusion of resources that that is in force and then that this is recursive until it reaches the valid anchor trust. This is the trust anchor that I mentioned earlier. So this is a self-signed certificate and it includes all the objects that would generate the RPKI. So let us now check this here. Bien, vamos a levantar el so let us check the validator. Vamos a 
hacer lo mismo en el en Ford. We'll do the same here in the Ford. We need to remove the ROA files that we had previously. And we will generate this here. Vamos a chequear primero con el, vamos so first let us check this here and we can delete this over here. This is running and the new file generated and I'll check what was created previously. I have this prefix here in port Bien. Acá tengo el prefijo Here I have the prefix 210620 and then let us check some of the prefixes we have that were established in the ROA. And here I have the other one. Maximum 23. And let us check this now. In the interface, the RPKI interface of RIPE. And if we go to the section on validated ROAs, I have an ROA that was generated with a slash 23 with a maximum length of 23. And here, let us look at the other example of the IPv6 one. And here it is. Now let us check, it might happen that some of the routes, because the validator might, let, let us check if some of the routes matches these here. This prefix here with this maximum length and this ASN have a valid route in the announcements. If we check it here, it's this AS with this prefix and this slash 46 with a maximum length of 48 is being validated here. With will create uh, ROA created. Let's check another one. This one, for instance. Good. Of course, here you need this. But we see that for the cases where we edited uh, our current. Um, information of the announcements well of course if we run this in production we see all this real time and all the updates will be seen immediately so now let's check with uh, the validator good here Let's see the variable. And I finish here. The prefixes are generated. Let's check the information. I have so many things. Let's check, for instance, this block. Here, 
with AS uh, 20,001 and this block, this is the maximum length. So this route was validated here of this ROA that was created here with ASN 28,001. So basically, we've seen the cycle of how I generate things in RPKI and the impact that it has outside and how I use that information. So when I use the information, I consume it. This is what I see here. The routers, based on the rules, will decide on whether we accept uh, the routes or well, all those rules that apply at this level. So we've gone through this stage and through this stage. So here we would have the use of this information, the consumption, that is what comes after all of the previous validation. So basically, this, well, for the installation of the validators, you use this link here of RIPE. This link of RIPE shows you, for instance, if you have, if you want to install Routinator, here it shows you step by step how you should do it. Installing the Routinator, so here it so sh shows how to install the packages. And finally, how to raise Krill. Basically, it's that. When you download most of these validators, the one of Arini you need a previous step before you can download it. And finally, you end up running running it. Then you have the RTR part in this validator. And here we have RIPES, the step-by-step -step installation. You have it here in this link. If you access this presentation and you uh, click on this link, you'll have a step-by-step -step description. And finally, we have another option that is the Octo RPKI. And you download the package, you run the commands. Here you download uh, the TALS, uh, APNIC, AFRINIC, LACNIC, uh, all of them. And finally, we have the Ford project that is that is. Uh, going through step by step and have the validators running. So let's go to the presentation. Okay. Here you have the links that I wanted to show you. It's these here. These are tools that we have at LACNIC to see how the announcements are seen. For instance, if I wanted to see the announcement of a LACNIC uh, activity, here put UY LACNIC. We have this tool that shows us the status of validity of the blocks that we have vis-a-vis -vis the announcements that are being published. Here, these are valid and this is invalid. If I'm not wrong, I then the ASN will do the invalidation and here we can check the validity of the prefixes and if I put a prefix, let's check here. It shows me the validity of the specific prefix. Likewise, we have a, a tool to visualize the objects created in RPKI and we can see the file with these extensions dot roa dot sir dot uh, mft or crl or we can also use this one here we put the route of access to the repository of that object let's see we see that that 
shows um, here all the information with the signature of the certificate, who signs it, the SIA, the manifest of the SIA, the repository, where it is, etc. This tool allows you to do this. And finally, here we have the ROA wizard. Basically, in Mila Knick, you see that the ROA in the RPKI status suggests, depending on the criteria, the creation of a ROA. And if they are valid, yeah. let's check here, for instance. You, why, like N, like Nick. It's loading. So it's going to show here, depending on what you put here, in this case, it was the organization. And here it shows that with, for this prefix, they created this maximum length this way. And it can show you the different options depending on the AS and, and the prefixes that you have. And the other way you can do it is by placing this. Let's check here. So you have this. This is what uh, it suggests. me. So these were the tools. And finally, these were the tools. So with this, we would put an end to the tutorial. I wanted to show you how I generate the information in the RPKI interface of Milaknik, how this ends up in the repository and how the, val the information is validated and accepted or uh, discarded depending on the results of the validation. So if you have any questions, you can ask through <coughs> the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. We do have three questions in the chat. I don't know whether you want me to read them. Here, here it is. Should I read it here? Should all ISPs implement, the question is in Spanish, should all ISPs have RPKI implemented no matter how small they are? This is a question by Enrique Avila. Enrique, let me tell you, yes. Actually, being an ISP, uh, as you are an ISP and you use routes, you should implement RPK, RKPI because you could be a victim of hijacking or you could uh, generate uh, erroneous uh, information. So you, you, you should use RPKI. So you can ask the ISP, and if you're a client, a customer, you can ask the ISP. But if you are an ISP, then it's worth uh, implementing our PKI. I don't know whether you want to answer any questions or if anybody else wants to answer or if you want to add to what I said. Once you use our PKI for publications, the rest of the institutions won't hijack the prefix. That's a guarantee that RPKI gives you. 
So that's why it's important. No matter how small you are, it's important to work with RPKI. And RPKI will only work if everybody's using. But if you don't have the cooperation of everyone, it won't work. Thank you. Yes, I fully agree. Tiago? Now I'll read the second question. It's in Spanish. And it was asked by Luciano. Lucia, Luciano Seniana. What actions are recommended with uh, the publications with not found uh, and invalid validations? Given this, the, the low percentage of uh, implementation and the potential errors that you could make because of a lack of experience. Thank you. I'm going to answer. The important thing, I think that when, when you speak of RPKI, if there are any problems in the server, then you see the announcement and you see the problems, but really if the routes were not validated, it's as if you were not using the RPKI. So, when you validate and you don't find any specific uh, uh, routes for this announcement, then it's as if you were not in the RPKI. So, what is the practice when you validate the route and you don't find anything in RPKI today? M most people don't have RPKI in the networks. So most uh, people don't have uh, that in the network. So in the future, uh, people, if uh, it would be good if everybody had uh, RPKI implemented. So there, it will make sense to do something with the people who don't implement it. Then if they appear as a um, invalid or not found, you can explain that it is not what we are publishing. And in that case, you can apply the policy. And there are two types of applications that uh, people have. Either they look at uh, the uh, applications that are not valid, you remove those that are invalid from the list in the community, but the community won't do much. So those are the things. We, you have to be very careful when you work with ROA because if you publish the wrong ROA, it, it's better not to publish than to publish the wrong one. Yes, as Tiago said, it's, it's like that. Sometimes it's better not to err. If you publish the wrong ROA, because according to the rules of uh, the organizations as to whether to discard or to accept routes, if you say that it's invalid, they can it can invalidate that uh, route and discard all the traffic. So if you if you're going to report it as uh, invalid, you have to make sure it is. Thank you. I, now here I have another question. It's in Spanish. This question is as follows: When generating ROEs at operational level, do you expect this to affect the traffic, namely the drop-in traffic? Just to answer this question, well, nothing is going to happen at all. But if you publish something that has an error, the ROA might invalidate the route. So it is necessary to have that notion 
that when you publish something, this is in agreement with the announced routes. If you announce the route in the correct ROA, then everything is fine. Otherwise, you might lose traffic. Perfect. We have another question from Roger Jimenez in Spanish. We already generated the ROAs for, our, for one of two ASs that we have, but I, I'm not sure about generating the ROAs for the second AS. That's my question. Well, this will depend on whether you are announcing routes through the second ROA. In that case, if you're using the, that AS to announce your routes, to publish your routes, then you have to announce the route with reference to your prefixes. So you have to have that prefix in the other ROA. And this has to do with another ASM. You can create the two ASs, but have to look and see if you're going to use that second ASN to publish your routes. There is another question. This question is in Spanish. I currently have a slash 16 with our ROA and an RPKI, which were created. They are announced with an ISP, but we're about to modify our BGP announcement in smaller blocks because we're integrating three additional links with the same ISP, but in different geographical zones. Do we have to create new ROAs for these new segments? I'm going to answer that question. For RPKI, you don't have geolocation because of the validation we saw in the tutorial. So we always take into account the different phases of the validation. So the people in Europe are also going to see the publications if these are published in the LACNIC website. So you don't have geographical validation. What is valid is what is in the ASN and the ROA. We have a final question, a question from Carlos Marsari in Spanish. Can only the administrator of an entity create the ROAs? Is it possible to create a operator, network operator profile? I'm referring to the management through Milaknik portal. I will answer that question. Hi, Carlos. At Milakni, you can create ROAs. This is the manager of the organization and the technical contact of that administration. They are the ones who can access the portal of Milaknik and then create the relevant ROA. So basically, those are the two, the two options. Or otherwise, you can have a technical contact that can operate and create the ROAs. So if you, there's a contact that doesn't have that role, they cannot operate RPKI. All right. So those would be the questions we had. Are there any more questions? Otherwise, that would be it in terms of the questions. Thank you, Carlos, Eduardo, and Tiago for your presentations. We'd like to thank the more than 200 participants who joined us throughout this 
session. I hope you enjoyed the first day of the event and we look forward to meeting you next Monday at 1400 UTC with a tutorial on IPv6 network operations. Please don't forget to check your email addresses because like today you'll be receiving the Zoom link and the passwords. I hope you enjoyed the meeting and I hope these were enriching tutorials for all of you. For us, it is very important that you had a good time and it was a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you and we look forward to meeting you on Monday. Thank you everyone. Tiago, Eduardo, thank you. Thank you, Macarena. Thank you, all the organizers of LACNIC.